I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, I'm still down here at my southern lair. Um, you know what's interesting, Jace, is when you, in my case, I've always lived in West Monroe, worked for the church most of my life. So I've never really been anywhere else except for a trip or something. And since we bought property down here, one of the interesting things for the last two or three years is meeting my new neighbors and kind of building new relationships, which is interesting because, you know, when it comes to your neighborhood, in our case, it's all family back home. In this case, these are people you don't know at all. And so, you know, there's always an opportunity spiritually, but also just to be a good neighbor. And so the house where we're at now, next, my next door neighbor, uh, is a, they're from Ohio. It's a couple. They've been down here about, I think, almost three to four years. And the guy, Jeff, is great because um, he's retired, so he stays here all the time, and he looks out for my place. You know, it's always good to have a neighbor that kind of looks out for you because we're not down here a lot. And so he'll text me, and he's back and forth. Something happens. You know, he's always on top of it. And so I got to talking to him just about stuff about our houses. But then I noticed I never saw his wife out much. And so he told me one day we're standing out in the yard. He told me her story and she had, uh, she had had back surgery a few years ago and um, apparently something went wrong and she wound up being paralyzed out of the back surgery, which is terrible, of course, and just, you know, literally changed their lives in a moment. And so now she's paralyzed from the waist down and so that's why I didn't see her that much is because obviously she can't get out and about, you know, she got a wheelchair and all these things. So we went over and visited her, Lisa and I, we wanted to meet her and really sweet, nice lady believer. And so we talked a little bit about spiritual stuff and she's got a set up there in her house, you know, with her bed and everything, but she's been sick here lately. And, uh, I'd been kind of, you know, hadn't, uh, I knew she was kind of having some issues. The, the ambulance had to come get her a time or two in the last few weeks. And, so I just sent a note to Jeff and said, Hey, we're praying for, you know, your wife and just, you know, let us know if we can do anything. And finally one night he came over and he says, she's asked that y'all come pray over her. And we were like, we're ready, you know? And so we went in stood around her bed and prayed because she's been having these issues. And it made me think a lot about where we're talking about in these texts in, in Luke chapter eight, because sometimes there's nothing else people can do. And she's been to all the doctors. She's in a situation physically that can't be changed. Um, You know, something happened to her and now she has to face this for the rest of her life. And there's a feeling of desperation, even as a believer that you go through from time to time. And, And the other night she was at that place. She was on some new meds. It was making her real weepy. And, you know, when we left, she's talked about what a comfort it was to her to have people that would lift her up to the almighty. And I just thought about it, you know, how many people are out there if you didn't have something bigger than yourself to try to go to in moments like this, what would you do? And, or, or, you know, what if you didn't have anybody that would respond like that and say, Hey, we'd love to come pray for you. In fact, you know, we'll do, we'll do it every can to help your life be better. And so I don't know. I, I just, I, I thought about that in relationship to this text we're talking about in Luke chapter eight, because you have these desperate people, one with a dying daughter, the other one with a disease that no one can deal with. And we talked about in overtime, what that cost this woman, which is basically everything yeah. uh, to have this particular malady. So yes. I just thought it was relevant, you know, she had spent all her, all the money she had. And I looked up just back then, how you tried to cure these diseases. And, uh, you know, it was it was Man, quite, it was it, it was quite the read. But like one of them was a concoction because they thought, okay, this woman, you know, she's having this problem, a reproductive problem, where she's bleeding twenty four seven, three hundred sixty five days a year. And so their their thought process was, well, let's give her a a you know a bowl of you know one of the things was the equivalent to like you know a piece of piece of a rubber tire that kind of material with alum and different other things they were like trying to basically stop the flow by ingesting all these particles that couldn't be digested 
And I thought, this was your medical <laughs> plan to try to put something down the hatch that, I mean, it just, no, I don't have to be a doctor to know that that's not going to work. But back then it was so <laughs> primitive and you can just imagine how that probably made things worse. They looked and they cut into my, uh, on your backbone, you, you, each one of them, what do you call them? Vertebrates. Vertebrae. Your vertebrates. <laughs> your vertebrae <laughs> bored a hole and put cement in two of them. And look, right now, I, there is no, I started out when they did that crawling from here to the bathroom, mm. crawling, barely making it. But now, it's like it never happened. You've come a long way. Oh. Modern science. Come a long way, long way. Yeah, but in this case, to Al's point, you know, the other story, actually this girl was the benefit. Her coming back from the dead was the was just a benefit of her father's faith. You just think about that. You're talking about the power of prayer. I mean, this is a window into that right here. You know, his faith, because it, it took incredible faith because most people— I made reference to this in in the last overtime. You know, no apologies to Tom Cruise, but it's it's a mission impossible that he's looking for healing, and then on the way Jesus is distracted by healing someone else with a less life threatening disorder, which probably makes him mad for approaching Jesus in the first place, and then now she's dead. Well, at that point, every human being says it's over. It's no longer possible. For me, you you would go into being angry with Jesus, saying, well, if you just hurried up, this wouldn't have happened. He's bitter. But Jesus gets more than what he thought that he had to offer by saying, trust me, don't fear, don't be afraid. One it's going to be okay. One of the guys yesterday morning raised his hand, and I walked back there. And this was during my lesson. He just kind of raised his hand. I walked back there, and uh, he had been diagnosed with cancer of some kind. So I just stopped what we were doing, offered a prayer that the Almighty would relieve him of that ailment. And yeah. I, I, we just stopped what we were doing, prayed, and I went back to my lesson. So... You never know who's hurting, what's going on, you know. But if they tell you, I mean, the thing, the, the one that's doing all this we're reading about, mm. said, yeah, let's just go to him a minute. You said they said you had the cancer. Yeah, okay. I said, let's, let's, let's. I said, you got more now praying for you. When did I baptize you? He said, about a year ago. I said, well, you're back. I said, let's. We'll, well, this is one of the things we get to do. That's right. But the point of the story is because in, in, both these cases, most preachers would it, just be keep going on with the lesson, but they wouldn't stop it and walk back there into the audience where you got a guy you just found out he'd been baptized for a year, he'd been following Jesus, but he's got cancer all of a sudden. I would say let's just, let's let's act on that right now. We'll pray to the Lord. Well, it's an option. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, but I'm saying he, really even if he's in not in the same vein as this interruption, Dad. It's a good point because this woman comes along, and the interruption is worth it because it's it's still a life. And and to your point, That's right. you know, most people can only think in one track. You were yeah. thinking in two. Yeah. That's exactly what Jesus most was doing preachers here. Most preachers "What you want me to do? Stop the lesson and walk out there and pray for him?" I said, "Yeah, sure." Yeah, that's a good idea. That's what I would do. But I even like in that, my point is it does give us a window into prayer and access, and we know. But the bigger picture is always more important. I mean, the fact is we get sick, we're going to die, and it's okay. I mean, if he's raising a girl from the dead, if he has that kind of power, well, he only validated that when he raised himself from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so— that is the window into who he is. That's why we put our faith and in, in trust in him. But so, look, Jace, you're, you're right. But he brings up, think about this. He, Jesus introduces, we talked about this in the last podcast, being a period of time where everything he's doing is entering in a new way of thinking into this new kingdom process. 
when he says the words, she is not dead, but asleep. They laughed because they look, these people are professional whalers. They've been around a lot of dead people and they knew the girl was dead, but that's not what he was talking about. He wasn't saying that she's, you know, a lot of people are trying to make the point where she really wasn't dead. She was just asleep and Jesus woke her up because he's supernatural. No, Uh it says her spirit returned. She was dead. What he was doing was he was introducing a new concept that Paul's going to pick up on later and changing the mindset of being dead to being asleep in Jesus. And, you know, and Paul's going to talk about this a lot in, in his New Testament writings because Jesus introduces that thought right here. He was like, for those who trust in me, you're not really dead. You're just asleep, meaning that you will be awakened. Yep. Which Peter, is and he Paul. Chose, Peter and Paul discussed that. Well, it's how he chose to illustrate it, because he said that in Mark's version, he used the Aramaic saying. So if you read that, it says Talitha kum. That's uh, Mark 5, 41. Yeah. It said, which means little girl, wake up. Or, or get up. And so that's why people say that. But when the spirit leaves and now returns, oh, she was dead. But it is it is going to be like that. And he took her by the hand, I think, is also, uh, you know, it gives you a, a window into, you just think about when you're a kid. Well, when I was a kid, if I was holding my mom or dad's hand, you pretty well think everything's going to be all right, which didn't necessarily mean that was true. <laughs> but from the yeah. kid's perspective, it is. And I do think it's Jesus's way of showing you that that he is the ultimate parent leading back to the father with us, that you know he's in his death, burial, and resurrection and the pouring out of the spirit. It's going to enable us to be sons of God. Yeah. You know, sons and daughters, but sons as in, you know, Galatians 4. So that the, what would have, you know, I said this was almost like a Hollywood movie when you start off with the girl coming from the hospital, one of them's happy, the parents are happy, and then you have this other woman who just diagnosed, and it ends up with her having this this moment with Jesus where she's healed, and then him stopping what he's doing and having a, listening to her whole story, having this relationship with her, which is what the what it's picturing. And then here the dad comes in in this special moment with his chosen disciples to for them to learn that it's not over when you think it's over. This is the ultimate mission impossible that has now become possible. And even then they still didn't get it, but he gives them this picture of him grabbing this girl by the hand saying, wake up, which is really what we all long for at the final resurrection. That's it. So it's, it's God revealing himself in Jesus, giving you these windows of what God is like. And the basis of it is love. He, this is the, you can't have a more loving relationship than a kid and his parents, you know, his father or, or his mother, which is why we started off this, this whole thought with, you know, this movie sound of freedom where in our world you have evil people abusing children for their weird warped, you know, fantasies. And so you come all the way around and you read something like this and what a complete total different picture where the God of the universe has revealed himself and given you this promise in this window that we all are God's children and uh, that was one of the themes of that movie was they had a song that came on several times during the movie, The Sound of Freedom, that God's children are not for sale. And uh, and I loved it. But uh, they were acknowledging who we really are. And in this moment, you see God. He's not He's not going to leave us abandoned. He, you know, him coming back from the dead gives us that hope that he's going to take us all by the hand and say, wake up. Let's go. And uh, let's take our first break, dude. Jace, our friends at Barrel Buddy, uh, one of our sponsors, and it's a company we really like because, you know, not that you can have the same value system with every company that you have that supports you, 
Uh, but these guys are really track a lot, tracking a lot with uh, what we do at Duck Commander. They had an idea. They were out in the field. Uh, they were telling us about it. It was their guns were muddy. And they thought, man, we, we got to find a better way to get the mud out of our barrels. And so that's when they came up with these white polymers that you have there on the desk uh, to basically clean everything out of your gun barrel. Uh, back in the day, I used to use the patches. I'd put them on a little end of a rod, try to get it clean. The problem is you're taking a square uh, peg and trying to fit it into a round hole that doesn't work too well. Uh, they came up after that with the boar snake idea. The problem with that was... It's difficult to pull it through this kind of rope type figure. And then, and there wasn't any way to change it out. So you could really couldn't tell what you were getting out of the gun barrel. So they came up with this process. It's a great one. They fit uh, all gauges of your shotguns, anything from a 22 rifle all the way to a 10 gauge shotgun barrel. So check them out. Great company, great Christian guys. Barrelbuddy.com is where you go to find them. B A R R E L Buddy.com. Check them out. It also shows you that we talked about this, that his Jesus touch, because this, in a way, you could add a couple of more untouchables into Jesus' litany of healings that we've seen in the book of Luke because of what was afflicting. We had a girl that was dead, and we know we, you know, you couldn't touch her by dead body without being unclean unless you were God in flesh and healed her body. And so, you know, it's just, again, it's that situation where he shows that his touch is something unique and he's establishing that sort of in this idea of the new kingdom. I thought it was interesting, Jace, because uh, the Greek word, when the woman touches Jesus, touches the, uh, the, the hem of his garment or the, you know, the tassel or whatever it was that she touched, the word there for touch is the Greek word hapto, which is the same word that Luke uses throughout every time someone is healed. And so it was interesting because even in that, the the Greek word is the same that she touched, not sure what was going to happen, but received healing. That's the same word that's used throughout for every time that Jesus touches somebody. So I I do like the idea that no matter what the, the uh, context for the story is, it keeps coming back to that same thing. And I, I guess, Chase, if we were making a movie, I would want to put my Dallas Jenkins hat on and say that this woman became this girl's mentor. They maybe meet after this has happened and realize they were both healed on the same day and then have this lifelong relationship. I mean, if you were going to make a movie, let's just go ahead and make it something that's really cool. Yes. Yeah, we don't know what it's happened. definitely movie like material. And that's why I said, if, if you were going to give a movie, a title mission impossible, this would qualify. Yeah, the whatever the latest Mission Impossible movie I would say is is not applicable. <laughs> That's just Mission. <laughs> but Impossible. hey, I'm not. I'll probably go see it because my wife wants to see it. But you know, well, and I like all those movies. So let me ask you this: This is another little interesting thing that happens uh, before we leave the story. Um, he takes. You mentioned this in the other pod in the last podcast, as that he clears everybody out. So he, he privatizes the exact opposite. So I want to talk about that at two levels. One is, why do you think that he forces the woman to basically confess that she did it? Because first, she didn't say anything. Nobody did at first. And he's like, oh, somebody touched me because I felt the power leave me. And then she she realizes she's been healed and comes up and falls at his feet. So why do you think he did that? Um, why do you think he forced her? Because she was obviously trying to do it under the radar, and we explained some of the reasons why we thought that was. This is much protection for him and her mind. But why do you well, think he did that? I mean, I think why did he put, why did he call her out? I, I think at least her faith, her faith, was enough for Jesus. She believed if I just touch him, he'll he'll he'll. he'll. Yeah, but he made her. Have a conversation. Is yeah, he made her acknowledge Al's question is why did she why did he force her to acknowledge what had happened? And I I think it's one to show all the people around that Jesus would stop and and heal somebody that no one else would care about. 
I mean, I think that's number one, you know, yep. from, from her perspective. But two, that's why I said I think it's more that he wanted her to know it's just not about healing you. It's about us being together. It, it, it's a, I'm after more than just giving you temporary relief in life. As bad as it has been in your life, this is not the answer. I'm the ultimate answer. It's it's more than you just having your faith in me in the moment. This is an eternal faith that we're going to be together. Yeah, that's. I think that I think that's my opinion of it. Is that is that it's the same reason why we go public in spiritual healing to to this day is because it removes all that from us. In other words, this woman had been in the shadows unable to interact and she was willing to stay there. I mean, she had been living that way for 12 years. So even healed, I don't know what pathway she would have taken to having a public life, but it would have been slow because she had lived this way for so long. And I think Jesus was saying, no, wait, hold on. From, from this day forward, you're going to be able to live out loud and on purpose. You, you're going to not have to hide in the shadows anymore. You've been cleansed. You've been healed. And so I think it's the same reason we go public with our faith in Jesus to this very day is yeah. we don't want to keep it a secret. We want to put it out there to no, your I second agree. point. Jeff. Now the second, the second thing on why he then made the other one private is a little more harder to understand, but my personal opinion, then you can give yours is that the, uh, the people who didn't believe, you know, these mourners, these professionals, were, I mean, they were laughing. I mean, who in their right mind is laughing in this context? <laughs> anyway, the girl's, That's a great point. The girl's dead. And so I think these people had such hard hearts that if he would have allowed them to witness this, because most people think, well, this doesn't make sense, because why wouldn't Jesus prove himself to them? And let them see it so that would change their mind. But their hearts were so hard that they weren't, even if they saw a miracle, it wouldn't matter. And so I think he realized that if they were in there, they were just going to come up with some story on how it was all a lie and then make it their ambition to smear him. And it might reveal too early who he is you know, put the target on his back and it might have thwarted the process of him going to the cross and being crucified. That's just my theory. No, that's, that, that could be true. Or in uh, another thought could be that, Hey, you laugh at Jesus, then you get out of the room. We got, we, if you want to go sit at the kid table, cause we got, you know, bigger stuff to do here. I want to ask y'all about this Peter, James and John being invited in, which is interesting because there's two other times that I could find in the in the gospels that there's just these three and it's really interesting because all three were pretty cool you know almost like watershed moments one is here whenever this girl is brought back from the dead the other one is the transfiguration which is basically jesus moses and elijah having a little conversation is looking with bright whites, you know, with this, you know, going on. So the same three again. And then the third time is when Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane, uh, on the, the morning of his death and has these prayers and they're there as well for that, which is probably at his most human when he's, you know, asking God if, you know, anything can be done, if this cup can be taken, and, and in that moment, I guess we could say it was his weakest moment as a human being. He didn't sin, but certainly he was in anguish. And those three, again, were present. So do you make anything of that? I mean, is that just, you know, him wanting them to see these moments, or is there something more to that? Because these are, you know, three key figures in the New Testament once we get to the book of Acts and beyond. so I mean, honestly, I think it's more just the growth process. They They weren't getting this i mean because greater things than this they did run out on him are, are gonna happen i mean he's fixed to feed the five thousand and peter's gonna confess him as the christ they're gonna see the transfiguration this is all in luke 9 there's another healing you know of a boy with an evil spirit and then 
all of a sudden you get to 946 and guess what happens? An argument broke out about which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wait, yeah. what? <laughs> what? What part of this are you not getting? And so, <laughs> so I do think that, you know, he knew, like, like we said, I mean, Jesus knew the plan. He, you know, he did become a man and was limited in some ways just because he's trapped in a human body, but he, he knew the plan. He's trusting the father. He's now being led by the spirit. And they just had to go through this growth process, but it's not unlike all of us. You just think about how far you've come in your knowledge of Jesus as you grow in him. And, you know, the, the way it should go is the more you're in Christ on a daily basis, the less you're thinking about you. I mean, you're slowly disappearing here as your faith journey continues. And so that's, bringing in the humility, but it is a process. I mean, I always use that example of the acorn that, you know, the Lord plants and look, here comes the tree and we're born again. I mean, it, it's the same concept that there was, there had to be a growth process. That That's what I think. So, I mean, look at what they did post-resurrection, those three guys. That's right. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, Peter preached the first sermon, uh, you know, James, he wrote his book. He was the first and, martyr. Yeah. And John ne and never was, but he was like the only one that actually died of natural causes. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, so it's really those three lives. You just look at what they contributed. And I do think it was part of these special moments that they had, to, had together because God, you know, we all have talents and gifts. That he's given us, but the whole point was we have the Holy Spirit and the fruit of that. He just knew that that we all have the same thing in common as far as the Holy Spirit and living the fruits. But some people had these special talents and gifts that he was going to use in a more public way, and I think the, those three guys qualify. Well, thank you, right. Let's take another break. So uh, I guess it's the summer of packages. I don't know if it's like this at your house, Chase, but at my house every day, new packages show up at my front door. Um, most of the ones that are at my front door have Lisa's name on them. Is that, do you have a similar experience? I've just noticed they always come in, but they never go out. <laughs> so it becomes a You're space, right. it becomes a space <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah, a lot of boxes to break down. <laughs> Well, there is there is one package that comes that I do look for every month. Uh, it's my box of awesome. It comes from a company called Bespoke Post. Uh, that's one of our sponsors. And by the way, we love our sponsors on the Unashamed Podcast. And just, you know, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to do this. So I just want to encourage you to at least check these guys out and see if they have something you may love. I think you'll love Box of Awesome. It's filled with carefully chosen gear from the best small brands around the world. Uh, I get a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I like uh, outdoor stuff. Uh, cooking stuff is what I like to get from them. So I went to uh, boxofawesome.com and took a quiz. Uh, my answers helped them pick the right box for me. So it's kind of like a little surprise package that shows up every month. Um, and what I do love is they support small businesses. 90% of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small and upcoming brand. Uh, each box is valued at around 70 bucks, but you pay only a fraction of that price. It's free to sign up. You can skip a month or cancel anytime. You get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code Phil at checkout. So that's boxofawesome.com. Use the code Phil. 20% off your first box. Check them out. Yeah, he definitely, it wasn't accidental that he wanted them to see some of these moments. It was interesting that it was a glorification moment in the Transfiguration, a weak moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, and in this moment, it was an answer to faith, uh, which is really interesting when other people were saying something. I want to mention one more thing before we leave it, because uh, I, I missed this before. In verse 48, when he tells the woman, daughter, your faith has healed you, the Greek word is sozo, S-O-Z-O, -O, which means not only healing, but salvation. You're, in other words, your faith has saved you. 
which is interesting. And when he tells in verse 50, he tells uh, Darius, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be sozo. He uses the same word. So it's interesting, again, from Jesus' perspective of this kingdom idea is that healing and salvation are interchangeable with him. You know, the the word itself, which, uh, again, is interesting because we wouldn't normally think about it. But when you have the power to heal physically, but also to forgive sins and offer people salvation, he's making that same point again because he puts faith into this context. One is the faith of the woman. Um, because she was so desperate that she touched him. The second one, as you mentioned, Jace, was the faith of this father. Because it wasn't even the girl. You know, she's just, she's laying there dying, but her father is the one that had the faith to well, go and yeah. present her case. Which which might have led, though, to people being baptized for the dead. You remember when Paul yep. brought that first up? Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15 was a controversial issue. But you got to remember the big picture. If you go to Hebrews 11, you, know, you could list a lot of people. Because I think that's where we do this. This gets confusing because it's hard to save people when he hadn't died yet. And so yeah. when you go to Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter, this is where we started these last two podcasts. It, it, it's impossible without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So when you come to God, you got to believe he exists and he rewards you. And you think, well, what is faith? It's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. But what I keep shouting about is that it really is the object of your faith, which is ultimately Jesus. So Hebrews 12 says the author and perfecter of your faith. He, he is the object of your, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And I've told this illustration before, but I'll say it in a different way. You know, if, if three people are being chased by a bear and they get to a cliff and they look down and they see icy water, you know, well, and all three of them jump, but the first one that jumps said, I don't, I don't think this is going to work, but he looks back at the bear and he's doubting. But he does jump. He makes it. The next guy's like, this looks, I know I, I'm going to be all right, you know. He jump, He makes it. The other guy, he's in the middle somewhere. And my point is, he lives too. It didn't matter what they were thinking on the way down. They all jumped. And they all happened to live. But how, what degree on what they thought their assurance level was really had no bearing on the situation. It was what they had to jump. The bear, you you have zero chance of making against a bear. So I mean, it's the same illustration you can make a hundred different ways. But that's why you see in there you have little faith and different references to that. But these were the same people that were discussing that Jesus was saying to that that eventually became the ultimate warriors for Jesus. Because at some point, they put their faith in Jesus, even though it was real bumpy all the way. They had doubts. They Well, it's just like our lives. They're, they're, you have bad days and good days, bad months, good months, bad years, good years. The bottom line is, once you get your eyes off Jesus, th there's where the problems come in. You know, it's it's a growing thing that's that's hard to pin down and nail down. I'm just trying to kind of give you an idea of it, but I think it's important. No, I agree. Uh, let's take another break. So, Jace, have you heard this uh, the new song Luke Combs is singing called "Fast Cars"? No, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> It's a very popular song. It's actually a cover for an old Tracy Chapman song called Fast Cars from back in the 80s, and it's a huge hit. And uh, every time I think about that song, I think about one of our sponsors, Fast Growing Trees, which is a big difference from Fast Cars. Uh, but Fast Growing Trees are just as important, uh, if not more so, uh, than Fast Cars. We know that, of course, from all our time in the woods. But also just when you're working out in your yard, you're trying to build a beautiful garden, 
Maybe you want some fruit trees out there. Maybe you want a privacy fence that doesn't look like a fence, but instead are beautiful trees. So a lot of reasons why uh, that fast growing trees is helping a lot of folks to be able to grow. And what I love about them is they just don't leave you in the lurch. If you got questions, uh, you can do a Zoom call, a chat call uh, with these folks, and they can actually look at what you're dealing with. If you got some problems with your trees, it's kind of like a telehealth uh, for your plants. Lisa and I have ordered uh, uh, palm trees for down here uh, at the Southern Lair. They work great. They showed up in great shape, ready to plant. They have what they call a 30-day alive and thrive guarantee. So everything's going to show up great right out of the box. Join over 2 million happy Fast Growing Trees customers by going to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson right now to get 15% off your entire order. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson. You know, it's interesting, Jace, because the last verse there in 56, it says her parents were astonished. Well, first of all, it said Jesus told him to give her something to eat, which I thought was interesting. I mean, it was like, you know, she's been through a lot. Get this girl a sandwich. You know, it's just I, I thought it was interesting that Jesus was concerned enough that he knew she'd be hungry. I don't know how long she had been. Well, sick. Lazarus did the same thing. And so did Jesus, by the way. Right, right. And so I think it simply means that, I mean, dead people don't eat meals. So I think it's just a validation. But I also think it's another thing that when Jesus did it, it was it was more of a picture of, I'm not doing this to stay alive any longer. I'm, you know, I, you just can't. It, it is me. I mean, you just think about it. Christianity is the only thing in the world that produces an actual afterlife that involves you, a, a version of yourself. Everything else is either you're absorbed into God, which is really the same as ceasing to exist. You know, this this belief that we all, it's like a drop in the water. I've read these things, you know, but it's like you're like a drop of water, and then when you die, you're dropped into the ocean of energy you know, of God. Well, you're no longer you. You're, 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 you're the ocean, <laughs> you know, but with or what that you Jesus, become energy, energy that is absorbed into the universe, you know, same yeah. idea. It's like, you're not you anymore. You're just part well, of the energy. Well, that's the big the Hollywood universe. take, you know, it's this right. life energy thing that absorbed we become you know and you're liable to die, die a thousand times and you're coming back even the reincarnation version you know you're something else and then you're something else and something else, and eventually you're absorbed into the big energy well think about it. none of those things are saying it's you coming back and in this case not only is it you coming back it's a much improved version it's an it's an imperishable version, an immortal version that you can eat, still eat fish if you want to. So, I just think that that makes way more sense, especially since this is based on history, evidence, and just the reading, just in here, the character of Jesus, that really is the ultimate evidence that there is a God and Jesus came to Earth. It, it's more in you just reading his character in all these situations that becomes undeniable to me, yeah. which is going back to the faith. These people were watching him and just think if you saw these things happening, there was a lot of people laughing and saying, Oh, this guy's a joke. How's he doing this? He's like a magician or, but that character is, it's just hard to get around. I mean, it, you just think how many people have dissected this and tried to get around Jesus. You don't ever see him challenging his character. Yeah, and I, I like that. And uh, this, uh, the Greek word in verse 56, her parents were astonished. I, I looked up this word because the astonished is not a big enough word in English for the Greek concept of how they reacted. And who wouldn't, right? I mean, your 12-year-old daughter, your only daughter, who was dead is now alive. And so the idea is, is this sort of celebratory, almost out of control reaction, which is what you would expect. 
and it, it made me, it reminded me of a story. I've told it before on the podcast. But it's been a long time of there was a couple at our church and they had a little, a little baby girl and she had cancer and uh, that they had found and uh, it was affecting her sight. And so they were up at St. Jude dealing with that. And while they were there, they had done another MRI and found this mass on her brain. And that, so their assumption was because she had had this ocular cancer that it had spread to her brain. And so it was sad. It was bad deal. You know, this couple, they're there, they're, you know, they're up in Memphis. So they're not there in West Monroe. And so Lisa and I wanted to encourage them and they were having to stay there. And even though St. Jude is a wonderful organization that helps, they still need a little money. So we got some money together from the church and we just went up to visit them take them out to eat, you know, because they're just every day in the hospital. And so her mom was there as well, watching the little baby girl. And so we go in, you know, to get them, we go to their hotel room and we prayed, you know, with them and we were going to take them out to eat just to kind of get out of the setting for a bit. And before we could walk out the door, the doctor calls and says that the mass is, they just did another series of tests and this, it was gone. It wasn't there. They had no explanation. It could have been a shadow on the x-ray, blah, blah, blah. You know how it goes. But basically, she was okay because they had dealt with her, the ocular cancer. And all of a sudden, for a moment, we were coming to try to lift up their spirits. Pandemonium broke out in that hotel room. I mean, there's crying and hugging and grabbing us. And, of course, you know, we just happened to come as envoys of we want to pray with you. And now all of a sudden we were seen as like we did, we did something, which we didn't, we just came to pray. But so that, that night that it became a celebration, it was my point. Yeah. And we had no idea until they got that call. It's just, it's something that's always stuck into mind and Lisa's mind. One is that you always go to be with people, but when you can be there in a moment where you get good news, it makes it even better. And this little baby girl is now 23 or four years old. So that's how long ago that was. But see, I would contend that the greater gift that was shown was the love, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. So y'all showed love, which is the character that you get from God. It's the greater miracle in that yeah, you say, well, point. she's healed. Yes, but she's still going to struggle. And but But when you gave her the character of Jesus— yeah. A fruit of the spirit. That is something that we all give as spirit filled people, which is I keep going back to that first Corinthians because it's like if you can do all these things and you have not love, you're a resounding gong. You're, you're yeah. nothing. And I do think, you know, God answers prayers today when it comes to physical things. And it is exciting. But I'm saying at the root of what Jesus' message is, he's getting people to buy into who he is as the Son of God. He's going to show the greatest love act ever known to man. And then he's going to give you the same spirit that caused that, Guarant that, that death Guaranteeing what is to come. It's guaranteeing, but then you have the greatest gift that you can give anybody, which is the love of Jesus, which is way more sustainable in this yeah. life and in the next. that That's my whole point. That's where we get off, which is a great illustration you made. It, it is exciting. This was exciting to some, but some even in, didn't believe it. But, and you say some, the disciples didn't even believe this th till post-resurrection. Only then did they really get it. And they had the power to do the miracles. I mean, Judas was doing miracles just like everybody else. Million miles away from the Lord. He, he didn't get the love aspect of it. And so I think that's at the root of this and what we got to understand as we move on. So let's uh, take another break. No, I, I agree, Jason. To, to your point, the establishment of the relationship was the most important thing because we were there, whether the little baby made it or didn't make it, we were going to be there for the long term with this family because we loved them and we knew that heaven awaited either way. What's happened is as a result of getting the astonishing news of that the baby was going to be fine is that we still established a relationship. I still get with Lisa and I still get pictures of this now young woman all these years later from this couple because they've never forgotten 
those moments of someone being there for them. And so I, I, I agree with you. The, the stories that we're reading about here, the woman, the girl, the, the synagogue ruler and his wife, those relationships with Jesus were probably never forgotten. I mean, they, they probably went into his post-resurrection and into the first century church, I would guess. Well, that's why I said this is more complex than it seems, because what about uh, Jairus' daughter? Well, she died. So what happened? I mean, it, 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 it should have been a different attitude, and we've all had this happen. I mean, I've, you know, been at kids in those same facilities that died, and, and we were, you know, Willie and I one time, we were the last person to see this little kid, and, uh, you know, it was very painful. But I know from reading stories like this, that doesn't mean it's over. And that's what you're conveying in this act of love, you know, to the parents, because I believe that this is a picture that this kid who's innocent, you know, a little kid dying of cancer, this kid's coming back from the dead. And so you're conveying that through love and patience and, you know, all the the fruits of the spirit that that you have on loan from God in, in these moments. And so whether... We have these temporary celebrations where kids are raised up, you know, on this earth from illnesses that nobody knows, or they're not. I just know by reading these, this intersection of, of these two stories that if you're in Jesus, it, it, it's, it's okay. He has the power, long-term, big picture, for, for this to be victorious. Yep. Phyllis, the doctors told her about that boy that her son, the lawman, I call him, y'all's cousin. Cousins. Nephew yeah, for cousin. us. Yeah, nephew. They they said, gave them a, a horrible thing. They said, the, the, this baby's got the brain damage. I mean, I mean the In best water. thing to do yeah, is that- probably abort, you know, and they told them, they said, oh, no. Phyllis and them said, we're all going to pray for her. So we prayed for the child. The child was born, and contrary to what all the all of them had said, every one of them, they said, "There's nothing wrong with his brains at all. He's fine. Right now, he's." But I mean, they were getting ready, wanting to abort him, the medical profession. But they which didn't. is why we don't. Had the which is why child. we don't do that. <laughs> That's right. We leave room for God, God to work. The child's and fine. Child, yeah, he's, he's the cutest be. kid I've ever seen, uh, to be honest yep. with you. I mean, he's amazing. You should have read the report that, that they, we got about what it. they wanted to do about them. Yeah. Well, the bottom line is the principle here is you can't hurry Jesus. And right. that's the underlying theme in this. He was on his way to help a dying girl, he got distracted in a good way. He helped somebody else, which is completely understandable, you know, to Jesus, but not to Jairus. He said, what are we doing here? And then she dies, his daughter, thinking, and it's no different than what happened to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You remember, they're like, well, if you'd have been here, you know, he wouldn't have died. Well, and so that's twice that Jesus, when you start questioning God's timing, which we know nothing about, I mean, the practical application here is he's in control and, and we're not. He's seeing everything simultaneously. Going, to back, going back to what you said about faith. Sure, it, sure of what you hope for, certain of what you can't see. Yeah, and even though you don't realize it, I mean, you, there's a trust that Jesus is asking us to put in him that is a supernatural yeah. You know, you're leaning on a supernatural being yep. who's way bigger than you. And so you see that even in Peter's writing when, you know, he talked about when would Jesus come back. And uh, in 2 Peter 3, 8, he said, don't forget this one thing with the Lord. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Or you could read Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, that's kind of how it's related to time. I mean, he's viewing everything simultaneously, beginning, yep. middle, and, and end. And so even though it may seem very difficult for us to wrap our head around, the bottom line is Jesus deserves our, our trust based on all these stories we're reading 
and his character being revealed, that he, at heart, has what's best for every individual in the world and in the history of the world, and every person there will be. So, and then it makes this statement. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understanding slowness, which is almost in a way saying, we don't understand all of how he views time. Can the computer get us out of here? Maybe we ought to go with Jesus. Yeah. And so then he (laughs) ended that up saying he is patient with everyone, not, not wanting anyone to perish. Yep. And that's the bottom line. I mean, you have to trust that and not get caught up in what we see in time and what we think is unfair or unjust. And Good point. people like Jarius rose up despite the end looking impossible and put his tr- he just went ahead and went with it. And uh, it's really a goal to where our faith should be. But it's just very difficult to do in the short term, you know, because we want it and we want it now and we get mad when we don't get it and it don't work out like it like it should. And so it gets us it gets us preoccupied with things that we shouldn't be preoccupied with. Faith calls for a lot of patience, Jace. Lots of patience. (laughs) Patience and, and even believing sometimes in the impossible. And I think that is the power of this story is it's such a microcosm of of the bigger faith issue and trusting yep. and, as Dad said, have patience. I mean, all those elements are here in the story. And, and another one we didn't really touch on uh, was that one person is seemingly unknown and doesn't matter. You know, and, and I say that in air quotes because we know to Christ every person matters, but this woman compared to – a uh, synagogue ruler, well known in the community, his only daughter. If we were going to prioritize, as you mentioned earlier, Jace, in the last podcast about triage and doctoring, even just status, we would have put this girl in their situation ahead of this woman. But Jesus doesn't do that. I mean, I, I think it's it's another microcosm that every single person matters to God and to Christ. Uh, you know, and another thing, it, it's I think we struggle with being flawed and trying to help other people. And it makes me think, you know, in Paul's closing remarks to the Corinthians, you know, he said he had confronted them, you know, about their sin. And they confronted him demanding proof. This is 2 Corinthians 13, 3, that Christ was speaking through him. Because they were like, well, who are you? Because they were bringing up his past or, you know, I'm just inferring that. But they're like, who are you to confront us about our sin? Look at you. And then he goes on to say in the second part of verse 3, he is not weak in dealing with you, speaking of, of Christ, but is powerful among you. But then watch what he says. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. And my only point is the reason that this woman's faith and Jairus' faith was appealing to Jesus was because of the lack of pride. They had humbled themselves and the pride was absent. And when that happens in your life and that happens when you confront other people in sin, you're then relying on God's power, not yours. Because yep. you, you've just thrown out all the bitterness and rage and anger and judgmental spirit. And you said, you know what? I'm weak. Christ became weak so that our, you know, his power could rest on me. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be desperate, and I'm going to come at you acknowledging my own sin. But I'm I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have that humble spirit instead of coming across like I'm better than you. And that was his argument in confronting people, because that really is the big thing. People yep. don't want to be confronted. Good point. And you have to do it from a place of humility. All right, Jace. Good thoughts. We're out of time. Um, we want to invite you to come to our overtime period. BlazeTV.com/slash unashamed. Uh, I thought we might explore a little more of this concept of Jesus and time because it's pretty interesting what we brought up here. So we'll talk about that and whatever else on our overtime segment. We'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. 
And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.